And so for the next couple of weeks, we're going we're gonna to hunker down in the book of James. And um, if I could describe the book, uh, this book and its application over our life, I would, it would be this. It's a, it's a roadmap to making faith work. Maybe your faith isn't working at this moment. Maybe your faith is a little bit distracted from the circumstances of your life. And James doesn't even um, stand uh, on the outskirts of our relationship with God in this book. He, he dives into this practical struggles we, we run into when journeying in our faith. And what you need to understand this morning is this, that he, he doesn't hold back and he, he tells it like it is. And here's why it, we need to spend some time in this, in this book. Maybe your faith isn't working these days. Um, don't be in denial, <laughs> okay? Don't play the uh, pretend game. Maybe your faith isn't working these days because you have drifted from what builds your faith. Or, or maybe your faith isn't working because of the enormity of the problem right now in your life and it's encompassing even, even the little faith that you had and you're kind of in survival mode. Either way, James is, is a roadmap back to making our faith work. But it had to be tough. If you know this, this book at all, it had to be tough. This is James having an older brother is tough enough, but when your older brother is the son of God, uh, you know, and, and your mom and dad agrees that he is the son of God, it had to be tough. And it makes for some interesting conversations. Can you imagine? Uh, a tradition in our house is that, um, and I can't, I won't lie, I, I, I don't create this. It's these baby books that are created. Can you imagine if some of us created baby books? I'm so thankful that my, my wife does it. Not that I couldn't do it, I suppose, but it'd probably just be one picture and a few words. But uh, she is a very detailed person, and uh, she creates a, created a baby book for every one of our children. And even our third child, because you know how that goes right after a couple of children, right? We have a baby book even for Josh, right? Our, old, our, our youngest child, our third child. And of course, you know, in that baby book is just pictures and, and moments in time where you, it, it's, it's precious, right? You know, it's, 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 the, it's the, you know, the first time, I don't know, the first time they smiled or the first time they took their first step. And a lot of things happen before I know, before they take their first step. Trust me, mom or, mom or dad, you're, you're getting through a, remember that first night, you, the first morning you woke up at 5 a.m. and your child slept through the night? And yes, 5 a.m. is a child sleeping through the night. Trust me. And all the moms who are here that have infants are saying, amen, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a scary moment. You're like, you wake up because uh, you just spent six months uh, waking up two or three times during the night. Anyway. Uh, and so, you know, it's that, it's that moment. Can you imagine the, uh, uh, putting side by side the, the baby book of Jesus and the baby book of James, okay? They're looking at these books, and we take our baby books out when the kids, we celebrate their birthdays. Our kids are 21, uh, our oldest is 21 now, and when she has a birthday, we lay it out, and we invite our friends and, and, and uh, our, our family over, and we have people, you know, oogles and ogles over the book and, and things like that. I said to my wife the other day, I walked into the room, and this is not even in my notes, um, I cannot believe it. It's, it was Friday, and I said to her, we have two kids that are finished high school. I'm like, how did that happen? And I'm still 25 years old. How does those things happen? You know, like, time is so fast, you know? And so, you, can you imagine, though, seriously, looking at the baby book of James? M Mom and dad are saying, oh, yeah, there's James. He's, ah, that's where he scraped his knee. You know, that's where... He, he got his first black eye, and look at those legs, and you know, the bruises, and all these pictures, and then comparing it to the baby book of Jesus, you're like, oh, there's Jesus, you know? Yep, that's when the angels and the shepherds and, and all the people just gathered around. It was all about Jesus, right? You know, and, and the star chase, and they, they came to him, and the whole world stood still, and like, it's just, it's not comparable. Um, they were, you know, and even their family, for example, they, they were even embarrassed by their brother Jesus. You don't, you don't believe me? Look at God's word. They said things like, at one point they said, he is out of his mind. It says in, that in, in the Gospels, he is out of his mind. Another time they said, Jesus, you just need to tone it down. It was one of the first times he was lecturing as a, a, small, a, a, a junior high to people. And they were embarrassed by some of the things that he was saying. He made claims to be the son of God and it had to be alienating that when Jesus was on the cross, the only family member there was who? Mary. And even in, to the point that Jesus asked John, who was a disciple, to look after his mother when he died. 
But then something incredible happened. Would you, would you take your Bibles or your devices and let's look at a book written by James who grew up with Jesus at his, as his older brother and this disbelieving and frustrated with his family. But some, something changes here. It says in verse 1, it starts with James. James, a servant of, G, of God and, a, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how, how, how did a disbelieving, frustrated brother become someone who doesn't play the brother of Jesus card? Okay? G- just says, a servant of God and Jesus. It's very simple. Something happened here to his, in his life. Something happened to, to James in his life. The Gospels are full of moments when, when people didn't believe who Jesus was. Even in John 5, the Jewish leaders are looking for a way to kill him, and his disciples are, are, are leaving him. And it says in verse five, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, for even his brothers did not believe him. Can you imagine how alienating it was for, for Jesus? But what would change James' mind? It wasn't when Jesus went to the cross, his brothers didn't even show up. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, it's, uh, as a, af, it's, it's after the, he rose from the dead, he begins to appear to people, and it says, then he appeared to who? James. Rumors are, and empty tombs wouldn't have done it. Changed James' mind. Any more than miracles of Jesus, but when he saw a living, resurrected Jesus, everything shifted, didn't it? From one who didn't want to be called a brother to being a, called a servant. And Jesus becomes a pastor, uh, sorry, James becomes a pastor of a church in Jerusalem. And the, the founding church of Christianity. And James believed in Jesus so much that eventually he even died for him. For, for Jesus. What did this? It wasn't an empty tomb, but it was an interaction with the living God. And that's what does the job in our own lives. It's because we have a living relationship with the resurrected Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so James is writing a letter, and it says, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nation. Now, before COVID, we would skip right over that word, wouldn't we? We know what the word scattered means now, don't we? James is is now pastoring a church who, who, who no longer can meet. They, they, they were scattered because persecution had broken out. So James is writing this letter to all the churches facing struggle. It's recorded in Acts chapter 8. The churches in Jerusalem were, were comfortable in their little churches, but now they are scattered. And the original church wasn't in, in, as innocent as we think. Jesus had told them on the day of Pentecost that we heard last week to go out into all the world and preach the gospel, but they huddled in Jerusalem. And, and persecution had come, and suddenly they had scattered in Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts. Not because they wanted to, but because something had happened. There was persecution. Isn't that the pattern of the gospel, though? Out of pain comes a message. Even at its core, J- Jesus came from the crucifixion to a resurrection. Today, you came from hurt to pain, hurt, so from hurt to hope. From pain to promise, if you're in the middle of something in your life right now, you can be rest assured that God is doing something through your pain. It it becomes a megaphone to bring honor and glory to God. I know it's hard to say amen there, but it's true. You're tempted to hide away in in your pain. Like the church in, 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 in uh, Jerusalem, to suffer silently, to tell no one, and in that the enemy of your soul will seep in there and tell you that you are alone and no one will ever understand. So instead of God building our faith in those moments, we end up losing our faith. And that's not the purpose of pain. If we allow God, he will turn our pain into a promise. Amen? He will turn your pain into hope. He will turn your pain into a message. That's the problem with the original church. They were hunkered down and God allows persecution and God scatters them and it feels lonely. It feels painful, but God was up to something. Do you know that God is always up to something in your life? He is. It's in the context of that James writes these words. Now, pastor, do we have to spend an entire month talking about pain and suffering? Newsflash. Most of the Bible is about pain and suffering. Suffering and persecution. Because we live in a context where if we are not suffering for our faith, we're among the lucky few. We say that, right? 
We normally say it the other way. When our lives are turned upside down, we say we are among the unfortunate few. But throughout history, the, bo- the promise of God is the forgiveness of sins and eternity with him, but not a rose garden. He never promised that. And let's be honest, we are in the, one of three realities right now. You're in the middle of a struggle, you're coming out of one, or you're around the corner. And so the word of God is constantly preparing us for that. These are, there is 108 verses in the book of James and 54 commands. But here's what James is telling us in the book of James, because there's going to be some odd language when I dive into this in a moment. It's going to seem strange. There's going to be seem opposite language. But here is what the book of James is all about. On the other side of your perseverance, there is hope and strength. Someone needs to hear that today. And I'm going to remind you of that as we walk through this part of this chapter. And so James is, is a very practical advice for a group of people where all, let's be honest, all hell was breaking loose. Let me describe to you what it, what it was like in that time, in that culture. You didn't go away to go to university. You didn't go away to, to grow your life. In that context, you live with your family. And all the parents are like, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you lived with your family. And not only did you live with your family, you took over the family's business or the family farm. That's where you were born, that's where you were raised, and that's where you grew your children. And in the middle of that, persecution comes and they are scattered. So with them, their entire identity is stolen. And they become refugees in other parts of the world. Some of you know what that feels like. You're sitting here in this service this morning, or you're watching today, and that's where you are. You are in this province because you have been, you have been pushed and forced outside of, uh, of your reality, and your culture. And this is what's going on here in the book of James. James is writing to these churches that are scattered. That's who James is writing to, and he's teaching them how to function in your faith when trials happen that is completely outside of your control. You're going to, through life, and sickness happens. You're going through a financial struggle. Maybe it's parenting issues are happening right now that are a struggle. We didn't cause it, but we have to live through it. See, because we cannot avoid trials, but we can control what to do in the middle of them. And so he begins by saying this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You remember, he's writing to the churches that are scattered. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking in anything. And so James is teaching us something in the middle of the nightmare of trials. And I want you to highlight two things. Consider it and know that. Two phrases, consider it and know that. He doesn't say feel good about it, nor does he tell you even in this moment to do something about it right now. Because that's what we do sometimes. In the middle of pain, we want to do something. We want to, we, want to, we want to pray. When we pray, we're telling God what to do, right? We're not asking God advice. We're giving God wisdom. <laughs> I know you're not, I, I know you, no one wants to admit that, but that's what happens. He's, he's not even telling them to do anything. He's telling us to step back from the situation, observe it, and think properly. Boy, I tell you, it's hard to think properly in the middle of a trial, isn't it? But it's so important. James is telling us the key to getting better, not bitter, in the middle of trials is thinking pop properly. Because many of us catastrophize, don't we? Like catastrophe, we think in the middle of something, we think the worst case scenario. Don't look at me like that. We do. What happens here is we put together what we see and what we think will happen and we create the worst case outcome. That's the definition of that. We think of the worst case scenario, right? Uh, Don't matter your personality. If you're in the middle of something that you can't explain, that's overwhelming, you're thinking through right now, we, we don't worry that a bad thing is happening. We worry because we guess the outcome of it. it I'll never get over this. That's where you get that language. I'll, I'll never get through this because you have created a, a, a catastrophe in your mind that the outcome of this is going to be the worst case. I'll never get through this. And then you isolate. I'm alone in this. It's what kills our faith. Because we spend no time on praying about it and more time on the outcome. 
It's true. Now, all, all worry isn't bad. Don't get me wrong. If five of your departments in your company have been laid off and you're not concerned about that, you might want to get your head out of the sand. I'm just saying there's some worries that are, that are, that are, not, that, that, that are not necessarily good, but it's a reality. But James is teaching us that right thinking is crucial to faith in the middle of trials because I think... Because how I think leads to how I feel, and if those feelings are misguided, it leads to chronic worry. We, we create this idea that it's real. What's going on is real. And we need to remember this. When life throws pain at us, how I think is more important than how I feel. <laughs> That's why he says, know that. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Because if you don't know that, we're going to catastrophize, aren't we? What I see, what I think will happen will create a bitter outcome if I don't understand the perseverance key is key. Consider pure joy can only make sense if we have the right thinking. And, and the right thinking is that God is in the middle of this. God is in the middle of this. God, we think God is at the end where we want him to answer. But no, church, God is in the middle of your catastrophe, in the middle of your pain. And he's producing perseverance in our life. And without being stretched, we cannot become strong. And if we will allow it to run its course, we will be mature in our faith through our trust because that's the goal. God uses trials to mature our faith. Now, I need to explain a few things because if I don't, you will walk away with Christian lingo and cliches and struggle with the reality of pain and heartache and the, and the losses we all face that are real. Or worse, when we are in the middle of trials and what someone will do is throw Bible verses at us out of context. That's happened, hasn't it? You just need to pray more. Well, I've prayed. I can't pray anymore. I'm done praying. I've said that. Did I just lose my job? I, I've, I've done that. I cannot pray anymore, God. And if you make me pray one more time, you know, like you, you have that human conversation. Because what I have done is catastrophize. I've gone to the end of the, the situation. I've created the worst outcome. And even I, I may even convince myself God can't do anything about it. It's that big. That's where we are. But God uses trials to mature our faith. So, so worry and anxiety and stress and anguish in your spirit is a normal response to trials. I need to repeat that because you have this inhuman definition of what you think faith is. Worry and anxiety and stress and anguish in your spirit is a normal response to trials. It's true. It is. Jesus did. The apostle Paul did. Great people in the Bible did. This is what we feel when we are struggling through our pain. There's this idea out there that when James says, consider it pure joy, we ignore the consider part and see, have pure joy and think we should feel something. We attach a feeling to it. Well, I should feel joy in the middle of this. It's very tough to feel joy in the middle of loss, isn't it? It's very tough to feel joy in the middle of where you are at times. And so we remove considered part and we see the few, have pure joy and we add feelings to it. So dangerous. We need to remember something as we walk through this trial. We cannot control how we feel. Someone just said, thank God, because I feel, you, you feel in the blank in the middle of this. We can influence how we feel when we think properly, but sometimes you can't control it. I mean, goodness sake, church. Our feelings are like a smoke alarm <laughs> in the kitchen when the, the toast burns. It goes off, right? That smoke alarm have caused me more anxiety because you even to the point where you know it's going to go off, right? It goes off when the toast burns and thankfully it goes off when the house is on fire, right? It's true. The same for either one. You have to go look to see in the kitchen it's to see if the house is on fire or, or if there's a piece of toast. Or in my case, when I'm in bed at 1 a.m. and when my, one of my daughters decides to burn toast and it feels like the rapture happened, you know, like the alarm is going off. It's the strangest things you think in the middle of sleep, right? Then I realize it's just my daughter, and she's no longer with us anymore. But it's the same thing. You have to, you have to go look and see if the kitchen, whether it's a piece of toast or the house is on fire. That's how our emotions are, right? That's how our emotions react. You, you're like me. I've gone through some of the scariest things in my life. I have. Some that you may know about, some that you don't. 
And I have uh, ruminated in bed over it and just my stomach have turned. My heart is aching. My head is exploding. And it's a normal response to this catastrophe, something that's real. And there are times when something small has happened in my life and I have reacted the same way. It's like I, I say to myself and I say to you, it's my emotional smoke alarm is screaming. That's what our emotions are like. Then I will sometimes have smaller things, like I said, and, and the same thing. But you can have some control what you do in the midst of those feelings. We can step back and consider it pure joy, not, not feeling joy, because of what you know, not what you feel. Feelings will change, but God is always present. And that's what you know. That's what you know. Whole to his unchanging hand. Oh, I wish I could sing in key. Uh, even the melody. God is saying to you, you have allowed your feelings to control what you're going through here. And there is only one constant, and that God is in the middle of, of it. You see, Hebrews 12, 2 says this. It, it tells us about Jesus enduring the cross. If you're enduring something, are you enjoying it? Just a little English test here. Endure and enjoy are not synonyms. We treat it like it is. You could get in a lot of trouble if you get that mixed up. For example, if your spouse spent the entire day cooking you a turkey dinner, and you sit down to that dinner and you say nothing, you just eat away at that dinner, eat away at it, or supper here in Newfoundland, and you eat away with it and says, don't say a word, and at the end of that, 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 that meal, your spouse looks at you and says, how was it? Well, man, did I ever endure that. <laughs> different, isn't it? <laughs> it's different, isn't it? Boy, did I ever enjoy that. Not the same. If you're having a root canal, it's not enjoyment, right? It's in, it, you're, you're enduring it. It's not the same. And sometimes we get those things mixed up. We think endure and enjoy our synonyms. And, not, and it's not in this situation. The joy set before him, it says. So he's not thinking the moment. He is thinking, he is thinking beyond that moment. He's thinking beyond that moment. Jesus said, endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right father. So the enduring part is knowing what's on the other end of it. That's what he's saying. He knew what was being produced by his perseverance. He knew that right now I have to endure this. It's not enjoyable, but I consider it pure joy because I know who is with me in it. And in that, out if he is with me, he's going to produce an outcome that I can only dream of. And that's when God is in the middle of it. We can only consider it joy and that God is at work when you already know God, for one, and when someone has informed you of that information, and that's what James is writing this, he, here, here's what he, we know. I cannot always control my feelings, but what will shape my feelings is whatever, whatever I let in. What are you letting into your life this, at this time, in the middle of this? In the middle of what you're going through right now, what are you letting in to your life? That's why in the book of Philippians 4, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's just it. When I'm catastrophizing, I'm thinking the worst based on what I, I see. I'm calculating the trial without the addition of God in the middle of it. How I think is more important than how I feel. How I think is more important than how I feel. And secondly, we cannot grow during trials if we have leave the process prematurely. We need to trust God's process. James 1.4 says, for, for oh, sorry, let, uh, let, which means allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The word perseverance is from the Greek word, and I'm going to try to pronounce it, hoop omanea. I just failed that. I know I did. Which means to remain under. And here's a word for you this morning. When you're in the middle of your trials, don't leave the process before the work is done. When we don't, James says, let perseverance finish his work so that you may be what? 
mature and complete, not lacking anything. There's something that happens when we don't leave the process early. In that perseverance, God uses what you are facing in in every situation, God's one desire for you in the middle of pain and trial is to draw you closer to him. It's to draw you closer to the Lord. Never do we realize our need for God more than when we are in the middle of our pain. And here's why. The closer we get to God, the less we will panic. I didn't say you will not panic. The less we will panic. And here's what I'm not saying. This, this entire message is prone to be misunderstood. I'm not saying that if you have an opportunity to remove yourself from something that you shouldn't do it. If it seems right, do it. If you can remove yourself from something without making a moral compromise, then do it. But for the pain and trials that we cannot get out of, it let perseverance finish its work. And here's why. Half obedience will destroy your ability to persevere. It will. We're not willing to obey because we're not always sure what God is up to. Whatever God is doing in your life right now, he is calling us to trust him in the process because on the other, here it is again, on the other side of your perseverance, there is hope and strength. There is. The story in 1 Samuel 15 gives us an example of, of this half obedience and it is how it kills our ability to persevere in trial. It's about a king who had half obeyed and didn't allow God to lead. And under the, under the cultural and pressure and political pressure, he obeyed some, but not all. It's King Saul, and Samuel is a prophet that says, Samuel said to Saul, I'm the one the Lord sent to you to anoint you king over his people, Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they, they, they waylaid them as they came up to Egypt. Now go attack them and totally destroy, what does it say? All. What's that all God is doing in your life right now that you're disobeying? And you're saying some and God is saying all. All that belongs to them. When he says everything, he means the enemy, their belongings, Everything. So Saul pulls his army together, destroys the enemy, and we pick it up in verse 13 where Samuel goes out to Saul after the battle and says, Saul says, the Lord bless you, I have carried out the Lord's instructions. And the instruction was to destroy the entire enemy and all the possessions. And look what verse 14 says. But Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of cattle that I hear? It reminds me of when I, my kids were growing up and I was teaching them discipline and you knew they disobeyed something and you knew that even in the disobedience, that cookie that's in the pocket that they shouldn't have taken or, or something, right? And you know that, that guilt, they're guilty and they're, the tone that they're using is a guilty tone because they have it on them. And this is what's going on here. Saul's answered. The, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. First it says, Sam, he says, when there is the bleeding of the sheep, the evidence is there. And Saul answered, the, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord God. But we totally destroyed the rest. So you half obeyed. Why didn't you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? And Saul says, I did obey, I did obey the Lord. But we brought back the best sheep to give to God as a sacrifice. This would be, see, this would be normal in, 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 in the Old Testament. It would be. Very often they would sacrifice burnt offerings to God. But this time God had told him to do something differently. And Samuel is reminding Saul of a very important principle. It says in verse 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than what? Sacrifice. In other words, God could care less about your religious activity if the rest of your life is in a disobedience. It's true. We wiped away, wiped out everything, but kept a few things. And see, half obedience will destroy your ability to persevere. When we are under the pressure of a trial and the only way out is to compromise in a tiny little area like every, everyone else, or the majority of what I do is the right thing, and we're taking, we're taking the path of Saul. Half obedience. And when Saul did that, he lost the opportunity to persevere. As a matter of fact, he lost his kingship. That was the beginning of the end. 
Let perseverance have its work. Allow it. Remain there. Don't be tempted to leave because perseverance is the secret to maturity in your faith. Amen? And the passage goes on, and let's be honest, when we're in the middle of a trial, we, we all cry out in some form, the prayer, help me, Lord. There's some, th- sometimes you can pray prayers that are neat and tidy. There are moments in my life, all I can get out is, help me, Jesus. <laughs> you been there? Just help me, Lord. A por- this portion of scripture that can be taken out of context, because verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should, What? Ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And when we read that, we often think that this is a license to pray for wisdom if we need anything. That's, that's not a bad thing to do, but that's not the, uh, the context of this verse. It's not praying to find your lost dog. It's not praying to, find, to buy a house, although that's a good prayer these days, isn't it? To find a house. You can pray those things, but this portion of Scripture is praying for wisdom in the middle of the most terrible trial of your life. And James is reminding us that when trials come, and they will, you will be tempted to worry about a possible outcome. You'll be tempted to think the worst. But James says, tells us, immediately, consider it, consider it, step back, observe it, think properly, God is in the middle of it and ask for wisdom. Now, let me be honest. When I pray prayers like that, help me, Lord, I'm really praying for God to get me out of the mess. I am. I will, all, I will always ask for deliverance, but seldom ask for wisdom. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? God, get me through this. Get me out of this. Deliver me, Lord. James 1, 6 says, but when you ask, you must be like, believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. James is communicating a very important principle as we persevere in the middle of trials. And this is, is this. Ask for wisdom in the trial and deliverance from the trial. You need to write that down because you're either, you're either in the middle of, of a trial, you're about to go into one, in the middle of one, or about to come out of one. Or go back in one. Ask for wisdom in the trial and deliverance from the trial. We are familiar with asking deliverance from rather than wisdom in. Jesus exemplified this principle perfectly in the Garden of Gethsemane. We are told that he, he went and prayed three times. And each time he prayed, as the team comes back this, this morning, each time he prayed, he wanted deliverance from this trial. He came back. The disciples were sleeping. He went again and prayed, God, if it's your will, take this from me. He came back. The disciples were sleeping, like some of you this morning. <laughs> and he went back a third time. <laughs> a third time. And he said the same thing. Remove this cup from me. But each time he said it, he said this, yet yeah, not my will, but yours be done. That's praying for wisdom. He's asking for wisdom and insight. He's saying, I want deliverance, but I also want to understand your will in all of this. That's what the prayer of wisdom includes. Lord, deliver me, but it also includes, Lord, what can I learn in this trial? You see, you can't ask that question, church, when you are catastrophizing at the end of the prayer, working out the worst case scenario. But consider means to step back Ask for wisdom. And in that you ask, Lord, what can I learn from this trial? What, and secondly, what should I do while I'm waiting for deliverance? What a powerful prayer, isn't it? Lord, what can I do in this moment while I'm waiting for you to deliver me from this? That's the prayer of wisdom. Ask for wisdom and deliverance. Then there is this trouble, troubling phrase. You must believe and not doubt. Those who doubt are like the waves. And when I read that, I Think of moments in my life when the smoke alarm is going off and whether it's something small or something big, I am, I'm catastrophizing, I'm, my, anxiety, my anxiety is up and I feel like being tossed back and forth. You see, when we think, we think when we're praying for deliverance of wisdom, we think believing is, is having no doubt in our mind. 
In the Greek biblical concept of faith is not about my emotions. It's not about my imagination. It's, it's certainly not about what I can see. It's simply about obedience. Faith is trusting God enough to do what he says. Faith is trusting God in the middle of my doubt, in the middle of my fear. And I'm, when I'm tempted to, to think of the worst case scenario, when I'm tempted to let my feelings govern what I'm doing, I obey. I step back, I ask for wisdom, I ask for deliverance, I ask, say, God, what are you doing in the middle of this while I'm waiting for your deliverance? And that's why we can see in the middle of it, as I look around in this crowd this morning, as we were singing, God, all my life, you are faithful. What's that song, the title? Goodness of God. And I don't know all of your stories, but I know some. And when you can sing, all my life, you have been faithful. And you've gone through an open heart surgery. All my life, you've been so good. And you've lost a loved one. All my life, you have been faithful. And you're struggling through mental illness. And all my life, you've been so good. When you're in the middle of that addiction and you feel like it's going to win. And you've thought in your process that I can't pray that prayer of faith because I have doubt and I have fear. And God is saying through the book of James, as the church is scattered in the middle of this trial, no matter how, what you feel, no matter where you are, no matter how, where you've placed yourself, I am in the middle of it. It's not what you feel, it's what you know, and that is this. The, the one promise, I am with you. Would you stand all over this room? In, in Acts chapter 12, in the middle of persecution, some of the disciples were put to death. And, and, and I, I need to, I, I, I'm, I'm ending here this morning. And they are praying. Some have been killed. And the next day, a church has a panic prayer meeting. You ever have the, one of those panic prayers? And they're praying that God would deliver Peter from prison. God sends an angel and gets him out of jail. And Peter shows up and knocks on the door. And the girl answers and screams, It's Peter! Right? Not kind of a faith kind of a tone. It's like she was shocked. She runs and tells those praying for deliverance. What kind of prayer are they praying? They're praying for a, de a prayer of deliverance to deliver Peter from jail. So what, what kind of faith do they have? Look what it says. They don't jump for joy. It says, you are, they go, she goes and tells them, and, she, and they say to her, you are out of your mind, they told her. <laughs> They're into praying for deliverance. I love this story, man, because it's where my faith is sometimes. They're in there praying for deliverance. They get the answer. It's at the doorstep. The girl comes in and tells them, you are out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting, it was, it was, they said, it must be an angel. It must be a ghost. They were so full of doubt that when God answered, they didn't believe God answered it. I love this verse, man because it's the reality of our faith life at times. When James says pray for wisdom and not doubt, he isn't, isn't talking about doubt in the way that we think. Faith is obeying God in the middle of your pain, no matter what you are feeling. James is saying that don't get so caught up in the waves of doubt that you get tossed around by it to the point that you lose sight of who answers and who can deliver, amen? Amen? I am preaching way better than you're saying amen. Amen? in the middle of where you are at this moment of your life. You need to hear this today. You have convinced yourself that my doubt is bigger than my God. And I don't want to super, super spiritualize this. And nor does James. Nor does James. There is trials and they're hard and they're tough. But in the middle of it, God, he is with us. Don't get so caught in the storm that you lose sight who is with us in the middle of it. And James is saying, if you, I love it because you need to remember this. And if you're going to ask, if you're going to ask for wisdom, 
do what God says, it would be in your best interest. If you are going to ask for wisdom when praying for deliverance, we need to obey what God says. James is writing to the church who is under heavy trial and he's telling them as he's telling us today, we cannot avoid life's trials, but we can choose how we can respond to it. It starts at how we think and reminds us not to leave the process too early and is also fueled by whether or not we will listen to the wisdom that God offers in the middle of the trial. Why? Why? On the other side of your perseverance, there is hope and strength. There is hope and strength. Would you bow your heads for a moment? Pastor Justin's gonna lead us in prayer. And I know that this is real moments for so many people. Because you have faced that trial and you're in the middle of that trial. And it's painful and you're trying to consider joy. And you've attached a feeling to that joy and you feel that you're lesser and you, your faith is lesser because what you feel right now doesn't line up with what God's word says. James is speaking to us in this moment. It's not about how you feel, what you feel, even when you are doubting. What allows us to persevere is knowing that God is with us in the middle of it. And maybe that's you today. We want to take a moment and pray for you before we end. I just want you to raise your hand if that's, you want prayer today. Just, just re- thank you, put it down. I just need prayer right now because I'm in the middle of something and I have more doubt than faith. Thank you, thank you. Put your hand down. Thank you. Amen. And my prayer for you today is this. Not only will you feel God's presence, because we don't always feel that, but did you walk away with the reality of this truth that God is in the middle of it. And he's asking you to persevere in the middle of it that will build your faith and that he is on the other end of that, working his will and his way. I pray for patience right now. That you would patiently persevere in the middle of it. Let's pray together and then Pastor Justin's gonna lead us. Thank you, Father. For your word today, thank you for, not because I communicated, because your word is alive and, and your Holy Spirit's at work and and that you're speaking to people's lives even in this moment right now that are walking through the pain and the trial that seems insurmountable. My prayer today, Father, is that you would, that yes, of course, that you, they would feel your presence, yes. But even more than that, they would stand in the truth of God's word today. That they would step back from what they perceive what you're doing and just walk in faith right now to persevere, feel your presence, walk in the truth that you are with them. And then when this trial is done, Father, you have something amazing on the other end of it. Probably not what we expect, but we know that if it's from you, Father, it's purposeful and it's your will. And at the same time, we pray for deliverance. We pray for healing in Jesus' name. We pray that you would speak into that person's life that is struggling today and you would heal that body and you would touch that life, Father, and bring deliverance, bring strength. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Pastor Justin, lead us.